You have to know a few things about Joe Rogan before you can understand why he was always in a unique position to be the monolith that he is. By always, I mean in his podcasting years. He was a latchkey kid, he grew up with outcasts, and he would spend the better part of his day with gamblers playing pool. What I mean by that is that he grew up with people who were very troubled. Like most people in media, he didn't have a formal higher education, much less being graduated from an Ivy League school like most people you see on TV. He had friends who rarely ever held back from saying the most unfiltered, fucked up shit. They didn't have to care about nothing. They were either comedians, fighters, gamblers, anything you name it. They never worked in corporate, so they never really needed to learn that corporate lingo. That kind of experience shaped his personality to a large degree. He didn't have to worry about saying the wrong thing, never mind being politically correct. But all this would change in his mid-twenties. He landed a gig on TV. It was all uphill after that, for the most part. By his own admission, Hollywood changed his life. It was like a huge weight had lifted off his chest. He didn't have to worry about scraping the barrels anymore. He now had the financial freedom that allowed him to be himself. Despite all the money, he hated most people in showbiz. He noticed people walking on eggshells all the time because they were worried about rubbing someone the wrong way by saying something and that would lead to them not getting cast on a show. So everyone faked being on their best behavior like it was their first date or something. Only this happened all the fucking time. They would all be over the top nice just to be in good standing with the producers and executives. This kind of facade repulsed Joe to the core. Mind you, he'd grown up around people who were the complete opposite of these spineless actors. In his pool hall days, he was around gamblers, addicts, and criminals that couldn't care less about offending you. The contrast between the two was comically apparent. So in 2009, he had more bags of cash than he had ever hoped to have. He was the host of the massively hit TV show, Fear Factor. That earned him enough money that he wouldn't ever need to put up with people in Hollywood who blowed smoke up people's ass. He was also a UFC commentator and very good friends with the owner of the UFC, Dana White. And as such, he didn't have to worry about being booted off the UFC for saying something unpalatable. So he started the show, The Joe Rogan Experience, in 2009 with his buddy Brian Redband. Since he already had name recognition from Fear Factor, people tuned in by the thousands from day one. The show wasn't anything serious at all, it was just him goofing off with his friends on livestream. On the first episode of the show, there was an uncomfortable amount of dead air, and people on the livestream chat were not polite about it at all. Even though all of this was fairly new to Rogan, he quickly got the hang of how to be good at it. He was cognizant of the fact that people were tuning in by the thousands. And to mitigate boring his audience by subjecting them to brutal silence, he would talk about the most absurd shit without giving it much of a forethought. I should be obvious, if you're gonna talk for 2-3 to three hours straight without a break, you're bound to say some dumb stupid shit along the way. Surprisingly, that dumb stupid shit is exactly what made the show special. Listening to him was a hang, it was like shooting the shit with a friend. There wasn't any format to the show, it was all chaotic and all over the place. No planning on his part as to what he was gonna be talking about, and nothing was off limits. Progressively, more people kept tuning in, episode after episode. And the best part about it all is that the only way the show caught on fire was through word of mouth. Before any of that Hollywood life, he was a fighter and that's one thing that he always stuck with. He had a deep sense of respect for anyone that dedicated themselves to any one thing. He's always been highly influenced by that mindset. He was self-disciplined from when he started to get into the sport of physical combat at a relatively young age. And he brought over that discipline into his podcasting life as well. And he stayed consistent in putting out an episode a week. There wasn't any other show like the Joe Rogan Experience before 09. You could argue Opie and Anthony and Howard Stern were similar, but they were fundamentally different shows. For starters, the Joe Rogan Experience was not broadcast on radio, or on TV for that matter. It was on the internet, so he wasn't beholden to the strict FCC guidelines. He didn't have a producer looking over his shoulder and talking into his earpiece telling him what he should or shouldn't be talking about. And like Howard Stern, Joe wasn't interested in being controversial for the sake of relevancy. He would talk about shit that he organically stumbled on in his conversations. Rogan was always more of a laid-back guy with a conversational approach to the show. He smoked a lot of pot and the weed complemented his casual style. He would bring on his comedian buddies and they would talk about all sorts of things. No subject was too taboo for them to touch. One of his close friends, Tom Segura, after doing the show told Joe that he didn't understand why Joe was doing this. He thought podcasting was a waste of time and he only did it because it was fun. Another very good friend of Joe's, Ari Shafir, told Joe that he didn't think that people had the attention span to sit through 3 hour long episodes. He asked Joe to cut it down to 30 minutes long. But Joe stayed true to what he had started. He kept it between 2-3 to three hours long, despite all the people that had suggested him to shorten it down. Podcasting as a concept was so recent that there wasn't any blueprint to go off of. People didn't think there was an audience for it, particularly because everything on the internet was so overly produced. Even 3 minute long videos on YouTube had jump cuts and background music and whatnot to retain the audience for as long as they could. In spite of all the saturated content that existed on the internet, Joe was pulling in over a few thousand people every single week. As time went on, he started gaining notoriety in the podcasting world. 
His average concurrent viewers rose well over 100,000 by 2011. A lot of people would tune in live to the show, with the rest listening to it after it had been recorded. Since the massive rise in viewership, he now had the liberty to invite people other than his comedian friends. He brought on people like Graham Hancock and Sam Harris. There's a funny anecdote about Sam Harris being on the first time. Joe had a few sponsors at that time, and one of his big sponsors was a flashlight company. And before every podcast, he would go on for like 10 minutes talking about how you could use the flashlight. Sam Harris asked Joe not to advertise flashlight for that one particular episode because he thought it was going to taint his public persona. I mean, to Sam's credit, it kind of would have been weird with Joe talking about flashlight and suddenly delving into philosophy and shit. That would have been an interesting juxtaposition. Anyways, to get back to the point. With how well the show was being received, plus the fact that he already had fuck you money insulating him from having to bend to any public opinions. He spoke his mind without a shred of second thought. His opinions were well thought out. He'd had a few debates with people on rather touchy topics. There was a high demand for a real person, someone who didn't always go with the wind and stood his ground for his principles. As years went on, the growth of the show was showing zero signs of slowing down. On the contrary, by 2015, he had an aggregate listenership of around 7 million people across all platforms, with audio-only podcasts taking the predominant share of the pie. Most people would listen to him while doing chores or while commuting, where they didn't really have to sit in front of a TV or a screen to hear him talk. What was strange about all this is that people in traditional media wouldn't give Joe any credence. They wouldn't acknowledge him even though he had a considerably bigger audience than them. In any case, Joe was having cultural conversations that no one with that big of an audience was having. He famously brought on Jordan Peterson when Dr. Peterson wasn't anywhere as close to well-known as he was after doing the show. After his appearance on the show, he quickly rose to international prominence. He did a few other interviews, and one of which was with Kathy Newman, and boy oh boy, did that one blow up. That one garnered around 43 million views. And this is only counting the views on YouTube because it's hard to calculate all the other clips that were circulated across all the other platforms. I want to mention a little personal story because when this whole thing was going down, I remember being enraged at Jordan's opinions when he was on the podcast. I couldn't bring myself to align my views with his because I couldn't understand where he was coming from and I thought he was a bigot of some sort at that point. I was a hardcore lefty with no tolerance for anything I disagreed with. But I dragged myself through that episode regardless because I was used to listening to every one of Joe's episodes. As time went on, comedians started being convicted of cracking offensive jokes in Canada. And that was what finally swayed me over to Jordan's side because he'd been talking about this all along. By 2016, the Overton window has shifted drastically from just 15 years ago. So much so that you couldn't even express a sensitive opinion in a university of all places without the fear of being ostracized by your peers and the faculty. It was but a small window into the shitstorm that was going to affect all aspects of society. This new culture of taking offense at every little microaggression started out in elite universities and rapidly spread onto all of academia. At that point, not one person in the mainstream media with a big enough platform was bringing attention to this, except for Rogan. And to top it all off, they were in support of everything that was going on. People on TV and other places weren't all that concerned about Rogan talking about this to his audience because they dismissed him as another internet guy with no real influence. Which was a blessing for Joe because that meant he could continue doing what he was doing with millions listening to him. He brought on professors who were being punished for making rational arguments. He brought on Brett Weinstein, a biology professor at Evergreen who was being protested by the students. Professors at Ivy League schools who took a stand by not pledging allegiance to the new ideology were being cast off as heretics for stating basic biology. And no one in prominent positions seemed to bat an eye at this sudden radical change. Joe was the first person I heard talking about cancel culture in 2015. It was right around the time when I first discovered him and I didn't know what to make of it at the time because he was the only person sounding the alarm bells over this being a consequential issue. And the reason why he was so early in correctly pointing out where it was all headed is because he was a comedian and he had a lot of comedian friends who he spoke with on a regular basis and they all had one thing in common. They all had similar experiences with performing in colleges. They kept saying that kids took offense to the most innocuous of jokes. They would get heckled while they were in the middle of performing on stage. Something that used to go without saying, that comedians were there only to make you laugh and they didn't really mean what they said, was not apparent to these kids anymore. Anyways, Rogan was right on the money when he predicted that PC culture was going to permeate into mainstream culture. He used to say after the kids graduated, they would go on to hold real life positions in the world and they would bring their ideologies with them. Because Rogan was huge, other podcasters took note of it and followed suit. They realized that Rogan was pulling in tens of millions of listeners with each of his episodes while being honest with what was going on. So now the small podcasters and comedians started talking about the controversial issues as well. Don't get me wrong, it's not like no one was talking about this before Rogan. But anyone with something to lose wasn't talking about it. They thought they would get the boot and be labeled a bigot. So the big names usually stared off this topic to keep their positions. Some quote unquote comedians to this day are still in support of cancel culture. Even after Joe proved there's a huge market for authenticity. People like Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon, Seth Meyers, Trevor Noah, just to name a few. But in the cause of turning a blind eye to anything that criticizes the left, 
they've lost all their credibility as comedians. And their ratings prove that their viewer count is abysmal. It's almost like no one else could have done this because Rogan was in a unique position to hold the line. First of all, he was on the internet where he could speak out with impunity. It's not like he was on TV or radio where he could get taken down on a whim because he was being problematic. And because the mainstream media thought that internet success didn't really amount to real influence, they left him all alone. They didn't really pay any attention to him. He had the verbal intelligence to make sense of what was going on and to articulate it in a way that was effective in convincing people where we were headed. He had everything lined up in his favor because the one place that he could have got fired from is the UFC. But he also happened to be great friends with Dana White, so that was not a possibility. All of this was enough for him to not give in to the artificially manufactured cultural pressure. One of the reasons he was grounded in reality is because he'd seen the extremes of both worlds. He had seen what it was like to be extremely politically correct in Hollywood. And on the other hand, he had also grown up with vagabonds. It's hard to overstate the impact that Rogan has had on the society vis-a-vis -vis his podcast. If he didn't exist, there's no doubt that people would have been talking about it. But I'm not sure if anyone as big as Rogan would have had the balls to single-handedly hold the line while the tides were turning and be on the front lines of cultural wars. He was one of the first people to speak out against the male-to-female transgender who was fighting in combat sport and demolishing her opponents. He faced a lot of backlash on that one in 2017, but that was the hill that he was willing to die on. Fast forward to 2020, he signed a $200 million licensing deal with Spotify. That allowed him to be exactly the way he was. He didn't have to do anything except for the content that he was posting was going to be exclusive to Spotify. Because of the enormous sum of money involved, the mainstream media finally caught on to how big Rogan was. So now everything that he said was being covered by the big newspapers and TV channels. For each episode he put out, there were thousands of pieces written about it. In 2021, while everyone had the same narrative in regards to COVID, Joe had on Dr. Robert Malone, the inventor of the mRNA technology, the technology that was used in the vaccines. That one episode was the number one episode on Spotify in 73 countries for a whole month. It garnered over 94 million views. That's a crazy number for a three hour long nuanced conversation. The reason so many people tuned in is because they realized that they weren't getting the whole story from the sanctioned sources. So they turned to alternate media to get the whole picture. The only thing that's ever come remotely close to beating that number on TV is the Super Bowl. For nearly 100 million to sit through a three hour long podcast has to be an indication of how distrustful people were of the information they were being fed by everyone, including the government. The Robert Malone episode was so popular that even the White House chimed in on the issue. They demanded that Spotify take down the episode because Dr. Malone was being critical of the vaccine and he was not doing the line of Big Pharma. So after all these years of free reign, Rogan finally had a target on his back and they brought the big guns against him. Everyone, including the New York Times, CNN, Washington Post, MSNBC, they all came after Joe. The attacks were very well coordinated. They were so desperate that they went back into his archive from 2010 and 2011. They took out snippets of his conversations from back then and put him out of context to defame Rogan. But you gotta hand it to them, it was very well orchestrated. Their ultimate goal was for him to be kicked off of Spotify and have all his content erased. They kept regurgitating that he spread COVID misinformation. By the way, misinformation that later turned out to be true. Joe was being cast as some tinfoil conspiracy theorist that spewed dangerous information. But fortunately for Joe, Spotify did not bend the knee. They said they were going to uphold Joe's First Amendment rights, despite being a Swedish company. The effort on part of the establishment to bury Joe backfired tremendously. People who already listened to Joe knew Joe not to be the person that CNN was portraying him to be. And people who had never listened to Joe wanted to know what all the fuss was about. So they tuned into the show to hear him out. And as a result, Joe gained 2 million subscribers in just one week. To the dismay of Don Lemon at CNN, people weren't buying what he had to say. By the end of the whole saga, the mainstream media had shot themselves in the foot. Any leftover credibility they had was gone. Rogan came out of the whole thing bigger than ever. It was a classic case of the Streisand effect. I want to give you a sense of his reach. I live in a remote town in India. So you'd think this town would be out of his key demographics, but that's not the case. I know quite a few people that listen to him rigorously. I remember a few weeks ago, I happened to be standing next to a guy on public transit and he pulled out his phone to play Joe Rogan at the exact same time I was listening to Rogan. It was a strange revelation. I mean, how can a guy who lives on the other side of the planet with a completely different cultural background be interested in what some DMT smoking hippie from Texas has to say? What about him is so interesting that transcends culture and makes people from all corners of the world listen to him for three hours multiple times a week. If you're a fan of the show, you probably already know what it is. It's the childlike curiosity in the most obscure of things. He'll talk to people about anything. I mean, he brings on no names that he found out about on the internet and puts them on the map. He'll talk to them for no other reason than being genuinely interested in what they have to say. And that kind of curiosity and interest in other people comes through to the audience. I mean, he brought on a farmer that had never been on a podcast before or wasn't famous and spoke with him for three hours while making it incredibly easy and fascinating to listen to. What's weird about it is that I couldn't go on 10 minutes listening to a person talk about soil without wanting to blow my brains out. But Rogan has this mysterious craft to make his guests sound interesting. At this point, I've been listening to him for around 9 years and almost every time I'm done with his 3 hour long episode, he's left me wanting for more. Some of the best episodes are with his comedian friends, especially Mark Norman. It's just two people shooting the shit and along the way, if they stumble on a topic that's intellectually stimulating, 
they won't shy away from it. With all the other podcasts out there, their format is usually a certain way. Let's take someone like Sam Harris. You know what you're getting yourself into when you put on his podcast. He's all serious and the topic for an episode is very constrained. On the other side of the coin, let's take someone like Joey Diaz. He's not going to be able to talk about philosophy or the latest medical research or consciousness or anything like that. He's all about street life and real life shit. But with Rogan, you get the best of both worlds. He talks normal while also being incredibly smart. He doesn't just talk health or comedy or space or philosophy or countless other things. It's all a mix. Much like a conversation you'd be a part of in real life. Only he knows what he's talking about because he researches and reads a lot. He's not trying to come off a certain way. He's not interested in being perceived as smart or funny or anything like that. He talks like a regular working class guy. And that resonates with people all over the world. That's why he's got 94 million listeners. All this to say, he's a truthful person. He truly believes what he says. Even though he comes off as a meathead with his appearance, he's a nerd. And I mean that in a good way. He does his research before weighing in on a controversial issue. And if he finds he's wrong about something, he'll outright correct the record. It all sounds so simple, but it's incredibly difficult to separate your opinions from yourself. For most people, their opinions are an extension of their egos. But Joe has mastered the trade of separating the two over the course of his podcasting years. Although he's done his fair share of psychedelics, so that seems to have helped him in this regard. During the pandemic, I went into his archive from the early days because he wasn't putting out new episodes as fast as I was consuming them. So I decided I was going to go back and listen to his episodes from the very beginning. And to be honest with you, he was a little difficult to listen to in some episodes back then. He had a tendency to get confrontational with his guests if he disagreed with them on something. And sometimes if the conversation got heated, he would speak over them, which did not make for a good listen. All of which just does not happen anymore. If you go back into his archive from just 2015 onwards, you'll find him to be a completely different person than what he was when he first started out. After all, he's still human and talking to as many people as he does for so long, he's bound to get pissed off now and then. But you can visibly see him restrain himself from yelling or speaking over the other person. Now, if he disagrees with someone, he'll give them all the time in the world to explain their side of the story and then try to look at it from their perspective, which is very refreshing to see someone in media do. That quality alone makes him stand out from the rest. There aren't a lot of people who do that, much less people in the public arena, especially with a podcast as big as his. He's a human being with the same faults as you and I. And when someone has that kind of power and influence over so many people, it has a way of getting to your head and feeling all grandiose about your stature in society and the way he keeps himself in check is by not thinking about it at all like when some guest brings up how much of an influence he has over society he gets physically uncomfortable talking about it he doesn't want to talk about it and the other thing he does is that he puts himself through physical health he works out a lot and he goes in the sauna with the heat cranked up to 200 degrees fahrenheit that's his way of keeping himself grounded because that reminds him he's still human and the other thing that happens when you get that big is that you fall prey to audience capture. You try to not piss off anybody, so you try to walk this tightrope. But that in turn makes them uninteresting to listen to. So it's a catch-22. The way Rogan goes about it is that he doesn't care if you listen to him or not. His fundamentals have stayed the same throughout. One big criteria for getting on the show is that you have to be interesting. He had an opportunity to bring on people that would have attracted a lot of eyeballs. But he turned them down because he didn't think he was going to have an interesting conversation with them. By the way, Trump wanted to be on back in 2020 while he was a sitting president. But Rogan turned him down because he didn't think that he was going to have a fruitful conversation with them. Despite him endorsing Bernie Sanders and turning down Trump's interview, you won't have difficulty finding thousands of articles calling Joe a right-wing Nazi. He's actually a classic liberal, but because of the way that things are these days, maybe he falls under a libertarian. He's pro-choice, pro-weed, pro-free speech, pro-working class people. The only thing putting him on the right is his love for the Second Amendment. And if you listen to him, he's got a very convincing reason to be pro-gun. That's all I've got for today. By the way, this is where I think the future of media lies, in podcasts like The Joe Rogan Experience. All you have to do is put it on and do other things while you listen to him. Not only do you learn new things, it's also very entertaining at the same time. I don't know if it's just me, if I get information off my Instagram feeds, that one does not resonate or it does not make me feel productive with my time as much as if I listen to someone on podcast does. I usually listen to all my podcasts at 2x speed so it makes me feel like I'm being extra productive because I'm taking in twice as much content in half the time. Not to mention that listening to something like a podcast is much more of a personal experience because it's a raw and unedited conversation. The person speaking is right in your ear, there's a human element to it. 